there. So these are these are the buttons. We'll go back here. So these are the buttons, and they are at different wear and tear. So then they calculate the volume. So how uh, how this different wear and tear affects the volume of the of the threads. These are different threads again. So fibers we have looked at natural fibers, synthetic fibers, carbon fibers, all these things. Mining is again another one that is uh, using a lot of visualization, volume visualization. Um, Rio Tinto is, I mean there are many, many, many groups within Rio Tinto, but one of the groups uh, which deals with the uh, in iron, iron ore um, has, has been using Vishti for, for a long time. Uh, we have also uh, looked at diamonds in order to see the um, impurities within the diamonds. Uh, then we are. This is this is an iron core pellet. Right? So iron core, right from iron core to actual iron, it goes through various stages. It it goes through various furnaces and all those things. In order to have the highest yield, they need to have a high uh, surface area so that the lime or whatever they put in has has. A big surface area to react. So they take the pellet and then they scan it and see what is the surface area. Uh, this is just one of the examples. Then we are also looking at um, uh, gold. So gold, uh, gold mine, Rio Tinto has gold mines. We are also looking at, uh, you, you see only this much tiny. <laughs> uh, to see the, the, the gold content and all the different minerals. So. Again, depending upon the uh, X-ray contrast, we can identify some. We can we can't identify some. So we are exploring that part in mining. Porosity is again another big one. Astrophysics, they generate huge amount of data. It's all volumetric mostly. What you are seeing here is this one is a pressure wave. Um, it was from a, a simulation long time back. So we, we can see pressure, temperature, velocity, and all these things basically understand the phenomena visibly. I mean, you have all these numbers, but then looking at that, we can see what is actually actually going on. Now this one is this one is not done with drishti, by the way. This was done with a different software called Houdini. Uh, now visualization, what this is, I'll just say, visualization is not just creating images. Visualization is, especially scientific, scientific visualization is a purely interdisciplinary technique. And you need to have some grasp of arts, you need to have grasp of programming, you need to understand what the other researchers are saying, so you need to have that interdisciplinary, open-minded approach to problem solving. This is essentially problem solving. We are solving a problem. The problem is that I've got this data. I need to understand it. So visualization is purely is a is at the crossroads of all these things they were coming in. Marine science. Uh, this is from National History Museum, London. Now, what you are seeing here are two fish. The top one is an angler fish, which has swallowed another fish, which is twice its size. That is the size of the angler fish, and that's the size of its stomach. When it was pulled out in 1996, I think, it was it was lying in. Um, in formalin, so so the soft tissue contrast is completely gone. There is no soft tissue contrast at all. The only thing we can see in, in CT are the bones, and I don't know exactly why we can see the eyeballs, but that's what we are seeing. Now, using this information, the experts were able to determine what sort of fish the angler fish swallowed. Now, there's an interesting thing about anglerfish. 
especially anglerfish reproduction. The anglerfish female is that size, about that size. Anglerfish male is that size. And anglerfish, male anglerfish fuses with female anglerfish. So when they try to, when the uh, male anglerfish tries to female, uh, mate with the female anglerfish, the mouth starts dissolving and it fuses with the female anglerfish. And the female anglerfish then uses the male body as a sperm resource. Similar thing happens with uh, spiders. We, we did a spider exhibit uh, four or five years back. Some spiders actually keep the male sperm in the pedipalps. The pedipalps are the, the ones that are jutting in front of their mouth. And then they can inject themselves whenever the time is right for reproduction. It is, the natural world is just amazing. Now, another interesting uh, fact, our cochlear, do you know that the size of our cochlear is the same as the size of whale cochlear? The reason is, the function is the same. It's just collecting the audio waves and converting that into electrical signals. So it's just the pressure wave that it's getting. And why do we get motion sickness? It's because in the cochlear, I mean, I'm completely digressing here, but it's just fun to tell this. In a cochlear, we have three semester kilocamels. This is swashing with fluid. So it's, it's like X, Y, and Z. It is swashing with fluids. And it's this sloshing of the fluid within these semicircle canals tells us that we are moving. Now, why do we get motion sickness? It's because the brain is trying to understand the information that is coming from the vision, the optic nerve, and it's trying to reconcile that information with the signals that are coming from the auditory, the semicircle canals. Now, when you are moving like that, your brain, I mean, your, um, sorry, when you are sitting in a car and going like that, your, um, the, the liquid in your uh, cellular canals is not moving that much, but your audit, the visual information is changing rapidly, and the brain is trying to reconcile that. And then, in some cases, for some people, the brain just gives up, and then it says, stop. It sends a signal to the, the gut saying that, please empty it because there is something wrong going on and I need energy to fix this problem and we vomit. Similarly, when you go round and round and round and then stop, stop suddenly, the, the, vessel, the, the liquid is washing around you and if you stop suddenly, you will notice that your eyes go like that because when you stop, that is, that is still swashing around and the brain is trying to reconcile why isn't the image moving around? So our eyes keep on moving around and then after a while it comes to standstill. So these are really interesting things that go on in our body. It's just amazing. So oil and gas, this is another, um, another field that is, actually that's that is the reason I started the industry, because they got a project from oil and gas. These were the first ones to use Drishti. So what happens in oil and gas? The thing that these companies do is essentially put a straw into the rock and suck it out. That is what it happens, really. So okay, that, that, of course, it's a very, very, very simplistic explanation. But that's what is essentially happening. You put a straw in the rock, and then you suck out whatever is there. In order to understand, or in order to facilitate that, they need to understand how the rocks are connected, how the porosity is connected. Because all your oil, gas, they are in the pores. They are not in the solid part of the rock. They are in the pores of the rock. So they need to understand how these pores are connected. Because if these pores are not connected, no matter where you put the, the straw in, you are not going to get much oil or much gas out of it. So they need to understand the connectivity of these pores. So, what they do is, 
they take the chunk of the rock it's really computationally extremely expensive to work on a piece of rock because there's so much data so what they do is they abstract that information so they convert that into ballistic model so the, the balls are the, the big pores and the sticks are the connectivities between these pores so they abstract this huge information into a simpler model that then they can computationally execute and then they run the porosity application and so on so what you are seeing here is the bullet stick version of that and what you are seeing here is the fluid flow through that uh, through another piece of rock so how the fluid flows through the piece of rock and the, and the color scheme shows us where the fluid is flowing where there is a fast flow where there is stagnation and then from that you can figure out what is the uh, the constitution of the rock so is there clay there or is there dolomite or all these things you can how will you find out the flow as in like uh, you run the simulation you run the simulation so you can also run the um, you can actually force the fluid in okay or you can also run so this one is a simulation but you can also force for the fluid so when you force the fluid in you take the time series so every few seconds you take the snapshot complete stuff but then like of course i mean this is related to the whole geology and everything of okay. it so so you you yeah. have that you can also have that right yeah yeah because when you take a whole of slides like you have to take multiple slices to figure out where uh, which yeah so what they do is yeah, yeah. so what they do is you have to so you get these long cores right so they take sample here 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 so so it's a random sampling and then of course from experience they know where to take the sample yeah. and they can afford to do that because a single rig cost millions of dollars a day to hire so when you hire a rig it costs them millions of dollars per day so they can afford to run these many times before actually hiring a rig So oil and gas is a big user. Anthropology. Now this was the data from uh, actually this is the data from uh, England. Um, there is a village in England where a lot of people died because of a bone disease, and the bone became basically osteoporotic, and these were buried. in a um, in a graveyard and the researchers got access it's amazing that researchers got access to these these skulls these were about 70 to 80 skulls now here this you can see that this is a skull of a small child why because the teeth are not stopped so this is about 8 9 year old child so what the researcher did was they she took the or, uh, orbital bone not physically digitally so i implemented the facility where you could digitally cut that section and take it out and then she did it for all those 70 or 80 skulls to understand the um, the porosity or the degradation in a way of the of the skull of the of the orbital bone well or, or this is pretty porous actually so if you look at this so that part is really porous this part and then there is solid part and then there are a lot of sinuses here then that part is again lot of porosity here because there are a lot of nerves going on through through here so that's why when you have dental surgery they are very careful because if they harm the nerve here you get paralyzed on one side of the jaw <coughs> uh also a researcher in as a phd project uh, alice alice i remember her first name so she did uh, she did a uh, phd in anthropology and she scanned um, the mud vessel pieces and from those those pieces 
she was able to extract the grains which were embedded in the pieces and she was able to tell the grains that those people were eating at that time. So, so Drishti has the facility to extract, digitally extract all this stuff. Thank you. Material science, I mean, this is all part of, you might say it's all part of material science, but again, we have looked at metal foams, open foam, closed foam, because metal foams are light and sturdy. Uh, to study them, again, they scan and have a look at the structure of the foam. This is also a foam, essentially, bone is also, bone is foam. So when you compress the bone, it breaks. So why and where it breaks? So this is one experiment. This is, I think, femur bone that the Farah, she basically applied pressure and then had the crack. So what you are seeing is a time series. So you apply pressure, take some upshot or take the 3D scan, pressure, take 3D scan and so on. And then you get hundreds of such volumes and then you can then visualize and then provide see exactly where the cracking happens, at what stage you get the bone crack and then try to identify why it happened there. Was there any abnormality that caused the bone crack and so on? The other one is is a pack of grains. Let's stop there. So you have a grain pack. So it could be in this case it's a, um, sand. And what they are trying to understand is when you apply pressure, how the grains move or rearrange themselves and then crack. So. So what I have implemented is a facility where you can digitally unravel. So it's a circular thing. So you can digitally unravel and you can look at it as a flat plane. So you can see all the sides together. So here you will see that the, at some stage, you can see the cracking here. And the grains also reorient. So they want to understand how the grains re reorient. So it's balls or different shorts of grains and so on. So again, part of mesoscale physics. Forestry is another area where Drishti is used. That group at UBC, University of British Columbia, they have used Drishti VR to teach wood anatomy to students. So they put the VR glasses and use Drishti to digitally dissect and see the internal structure of the wood. This is English Bureau. Uh, Phil Evans, the researcher there, has conducted research on cricket bats. He is a cricket fan. Yes. <laughs> and we all know that Kashmir Bureau is the best for this. <coughs> English Bureau comes second. And he scanned Kashmir Bureau, English Bureau. But we were not able to understand why Kashmir Bureau is good. Because the structure looks very similar but still, why Kashmir Ulu is better than English Ulu, we don't really know. Yeah. So visualization doesn't help? No, not so far. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. So he has also, well, I mean, how the cricket bat gets its um, stroke? It's not just the main blade, but it's how the handle is connected to the main blade as well, and how the handle is constructed. So all these factors, and then, how the main blade, where is the thickness, where is the thinness, and so on. All these factors affect. He has actually created a bat. You can, he, he can tailor me the bat using lathe machine to suit wherever you want the sweet spot, how big, how long you want the sweet, or sweet, uh, sweet spot, and so on. Uh, another area where Drishti is used is to understand the, um, the wood, the antifungal properties. So when they use wood in construction, the wood is always treated with antifungal, so antifungal solution. So what they do is they put the logs in a in a bath uh, of copper sulfate and all sorts of chemicals. I don't I don't know exactly which ones, but they immerse the wood in these baths and then they keep it for a week or so, so that the the liquid penetrates into the pores of the wood and it cures that and it then retains that antifungal because that's an antifungal solution that they are putting. 
The other method they are, they are trying is using nanoparticles. What they do is they blast the wood with nanoparticles which contain the antifungal whatever solution or particles there. So what they want to understand is how deep these nanoparticles penetrate. So that's why they, they blast the wood with nanoparticles and then they scan it to understand how deep that penetration is. And then of course there are other testing that you actually put that in different environments to see whether it really works and not so on and so forth. But it's to understand how deep the penetration is in terms of liquid as well as the nanoparticles. Now if this technique works, the nanoparticles, then it will be a lot cheaper and it will be a lot faster because you just block the wood and the, it's treated. So that's another area. Semiconductors. It's to understand the defects in semiconductors. Now, some time back, uh, three, four years back, Samsung had problems. The batteries were basically blowing up. They were heating up and then they were expanding and then they would blow. So the problem was resolved by CT scan. So they engaged a company, um, that, was, that was scanned in China, and they scanned the hundreds of these phones, and then they were able to figure out that there was defecting connection and so on and so forth, whatever. Man, of course it is not disclosed, but they were able to figure out. Now here you will see that there are defects in the, um, uh, in the welding. What is it called? Solder. Solder. Okay. So you will see the bubbles in the solder here. So this was done for a company called Xrenia. So all of this data was taken through microchip. Yes. Okay. So they have to put these boards and then scan it. So what resolution was it? This was a long time back, so it would be, this would be in microns, so a few microns, so five, six microns, definitely. So semiconductor industry is another one, paleontology. So this is, it's for this, this reason I got the, we got the, the medal, this. So these, so we, there are four of us uh, for the J.O. Westwood uh, medal, for excellence in taxonomy. Uh, so these are fossils in amber. These are 40 million year old fossils in amber. So these are insects, so they're weevils. They were embedded in the, in the amber. These are air bubbles. So these are, I suspect, are the last gasps of that insect or that weevil. So because that got trapped in a sap and then they would be struggling and so on. But these are some really good ones. So, so we are four of we have four people working on this data set. Uh, well, 67 data sets. So we have 67 samples, we scanned them. Now why did we use <coughs> CT? Well, because amber is uh, maybe you can see through the amber, but Lot of these have impurities because it's through a sap, so there is a lot of material there embedded in the along with the with the with the sample. So my role, I don't understand much about entomology, but my role was to digitally clean those images and create the versions that they can use and present and they can understand. This is another one, this is a, a, a fish fossil. And that's from China. That's the cochlea. <coughs> that's the cochlea. That's how cochlea looks like. But that's fossilized, of course. But that's how cochlea looks like. It's the same, no matter where you go. So how were you able to clean the noise? Huh? Like what, what did you use to take the noise out? So you can use a bit of smoothing, then 
you can actually, so I have implemented uh, functionality where you can actually go in and paint. So like um, paleontologists, they use a brush to clean up. So I have implemented that in Vishnu. So they can actually go in and clean up. Then you can use uh, the intensity of the of the data, intensity of the voxels. You can use gradients, how the function is changing in the neighborhood. So for example, if the function is changing rapidly in the neighborhood, then you can be sure that you are in a boundary. Mountain mm -hmm. Now, again, this is a bit of technical. Now, why higher gradients mean you are close to the boundary? So, into the question. <laughs> so, just imagine that this is at higher density, and that inner portion is at a at a even higher density. So, there is air here, then there is say density say one twenty s. So let's just take two, air and say 128. Now, if you're in the air phase, then most of the voxels, we call it voxels, the data points around you have the similar value, which means that the gradient, which is essentially change in function value, is very low, close to zero or very low. As you start approaching the boundary, in the real case, the fun now because this is a solid higher density one, the function values will start rising. So if you shoot a ray, for example, from air phase to this, the function values will start rising. The function values will start rising, which means that if I'm standing here, then the voxel here could be higher than me or could be lower than me. Same in this case, which means that your gradient is not going to be zero. It's going to be higher. And then as you approach the high density phase, once you enter the high density phase, if I'm standing here, then the voxels here or around me are going to be very similar, which means that the gradient is going to be very low. So that's why higher gradient usually means you are on a boundary. But with noise, of course, you have to cater for noise. Then you can apply smoothing techniques, then um, there are other techniques where you can cater to noise and now there are also techniques using machine learning they are still of course being developed <laughs> then you can, they can you can use the texture information to extract another way to extract is using the gradient information and what I've implemented is you can actually draw a boundary around a region and it hugs to the hill or the valley it's called live wire technique. So it, you click a point here, and then when you go here, the, it will draw a, a line automatically hugging the along the gradient. So there are few techniques. We come to public spaces. So museums, art installations, exhibitions, and so on. Now that is a very old exhibit, it's still going on at the Museum of Old and New Art Mona in Tasmania. That exhibit was installed in 2010. What they have is a big room, dark, completely dark, and they have a mummy on one side, the actual mummy, that's one. And then they have a digital version of that mummy on the other side, same size. The visitors walk through in the dark. They allow only one or two people, or yeah, one or two people only at a time. The ground is completely dark. It is filled with dark water. You walk on the plank, and then you go into that chamber here. And then you have the real mummy on one side and the digital on the other side. And these are just the some snapshots of that. And then you can see the digital version or digital dissection of, of that movie, of that mummy. This is another exhibit, the, the spiders exhibit that I was talking about. So this one here, the uh, visualization expert Paul Burke used Drishti to create that exhibit. So I have not, cre I have not uh, created that exhibit. 
but Paul Burke used Drishti to create that imprint. That is Drishti Prayog. So that's so it's a touch screen based. Anybody can download it. You can use it on your laptop. If you, even if you don't have a touch screen, you can just use keyboard and mouse. But that's that's how it operates. And that was the spider exhibit that we did three, four years ago. It's a Kaveri exhibit. So goes on. So that was in Canberra. Then it moved to Adelaide, Brisbane, and so on. Then another exhibit that we did was at the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. That's a um, pill bug. So these are the garden. Uh, these are found in garden. They eat the organic stuff. These are really tiny, and when you touch them, they just curl quickly. So that's a pill bug. So this was again done, done using Drishti by an artist who used Drishti to create that exhibit. What you are seeing here is the insides of the pill bug, that the stomach of the pill bug, and that was projected in 3D. So you wear the 3D glasses, and it would be projected. it would be basically floating in front of you. Now I'll come to the the exhibit that I was talking about, that we did in Canberra. In we were working on that exhibit for about a year in 2001, I think 2000 2001. The exhibit is called or was called Case Space. That exhibit uh, was installed in 2001 or 2002, and it was supposed to be there for about five years. It was supposed to be decommissioned in 2006 and so on, but. The demand was so big that they kept the exhibit till 2010 or 2012 before they decommissioned it and got it got done by another group. So what is K space? K space is kids space. When the museum in Canberra, um, that was newly developed museum in Canberra, and they wanted to have an exhibit catering to kids. So they approached us at the ANU. So that time we were ANU sir, and then they gave us a an idea, so that we want to engage the kids in the museum. We want to have the kids to have a good time in the museum. You will be allotted a big space. Do what you want. So the, the, the leader of the project, my uh, colleague Drew Whitehouse, he invited kids from year three, year four, so standard three and standard four, and then asked them to draw the city of their imagination, of the future. So what, what would the future be like? What would be the houses in the future be like? What would be the cars be like? What would be your city look like? And then they drew all these images from their imagination. We engaged an animator, an, an artist, to create versions of these, these models, these buildings, these cars. Uh, they were detachable models. So you had a main component, and then you can attach something to it, attach something to it, and so on and so forth. That was 2000, 2001. So we didn't have Unity and any of these things. So Drew Whitehouse wrote the software to, to, to project, to show those, uh, those um, models. So we engaged the animator. He created all different versions of, of these models. Uh, say, the main body of the vehicle, then you have propellers, then you have um, some uh, uh, wings. And all sorts of things, all sorts of organic things. The, the kids all drew organic stuff. There were no, no straight lines. They were all curved. They were all beautiful. Similarly with the houses. You have the house, the main body, then the windows, then you have a big doorway, something like that. Then you have uh, say a windmill. Because we had asked them to imagine the future. What would the future look like? What is the, the future of your imagination? What, how, the, how would we use the power? What would be the power source? How would people move around? So we let the creativity flow through, and then they came with beautiful wild ideas. Then Drew created a, a mock-up city uh, with all the Australian icons. So there was um, uh, 
the opera house, then there was uh, Hills Voice, there was Kukavara. So Kukavara is a, is a bird that goes really noisy bird in Australia. Then here magpies there, magpies are again a big uh, Australian thing. And also so, uh, Australian icons, he, he populated the city with the Australian icons. We had the big city model, uh, virtual of course. Then we had the pulsating music to go through. And then the exhibit, let me describe the exhibit. So the exhibit had 15 computers working together. Now kids, their attention span is short. So what we had was each of these buildings or the vehicles that they created would have their own photo. In order to do that, when they first approached the, uh, the exhibit, their photo was taken on a blue screen with a blue screen background. Then they went into a, a waiting area. Now, you know that in a waiting, waiting is very boring. It is extremely tedious. So in order to alleviate that, we had a big screen in the waiting area where the models from the previous show were shown there with their pictures and so on. So the kids would see what the other kids had created and that would trigger their imagination again. And they would, they would be very happy to see their own, because what happened usually was the kid would go through the exhibit and then straight away run back and go through another round. It happened many times. They would just go through the exhibit and come back again. So they would be sitting in the uh, waiting area. The entire uh, duration of the exhibit was about 10 or 12 minutes. So the waiting time was about four or five minutes, which is a very long time for a kid. Even for an adult, they would, they probably don't wait for five minutes. But for five minutes, these kids would be sitting in there and squealing and looking at their, their photos or their friends' photos. And then they would be engaged there from that point. So that was the one machine that was controlling the, um, the photo studio, the photo booth. The other was controlling the, uh, the, um, what do you call the, the waiting area screen. Then they would go inside and then there were six, uh, six booths or six terminals which would do uh, vehicles, six would do uh, buildings. And then they would go through the user interface to select, I want to have this cover, I want to have that cover, I want to put propellers there, I want to have a nuclear reactor, I want to have a windmill and so on and so forth. And they would treat